Ladies and gentlemen, I am Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran, and this is the Backroom's First Contact. Let's get into it. Okay, this is actually funny. Uh, man, I feel so old. In the 90s, there were video, uh, video cassette tapes, right? That's how, that's the medium that uh, movies were distributed, right? So it used to be, gosh, okay. So remember before the pandemic, when you would get a theater release of a movie and then three, four weeks, a month later uh, or more, it would release on DVD or on the streaming services, right? Uh, and before that, they would, you know, yeah, drop just on DVD before streaming services were big. Well, before that, they would drop on VHS cassette. And what would happen is the VHS cassettes were easy. Anyone with a VCR could make a copy of those movies. And obviously, a huge portion of the revenue of these post theater release movies uh, came from video cassette tapes that people would buy and watch again and again. Um, you know, a lot of it, I think like when I was a kid, obviously it was kids movies, right? You would watch The Little Mermaid or Toy Story, you know, 60 times because you're a kid. That's what kids do. So in order to scare the public out of making copies of the video, which it's not even clear that that's illegal as long as you don't sell them, uh, they would put this giant FBI warning. And this is actually not what it looked like. And this is probably a smart move by Kane because the actual warning was like, like had the Department of Justice seal right here and it would specify exactly which uh, part of federal law you were violating by copying the Little Mermaid and giving it to your mom. Like, how dare you, sir? Uh, it was it was pretty preposterous as we think about it. Um, but it just goes to show the lengths that the uh, companies would go to to stop you from duplicating their IP. Again, it's not clear that it's illegal to copy a tape that you own. You own it. It's yours. You just can't go to the corner store and sell your bootleg copies of The Little Mermaid. So to be fair, when I was in Afghanistan, buying bootleg copies of things was the norm. I watched every season of Mad Men, well, the first half, as many seasons as were out at that time, uh, through bootleg DVD copies that didn't even have a label. It would just be like, Mad Man. <laughs> but hey, they were legit. Okay, what I really love also about async is async, uh, short for asynchronous, which is a term for when two oftentimes musical instruments or waveforms of any kind are out of sync and are operate at are behaving independently, which is sort of an analog to the back rooms itself. So let's see. Okay, so what that looked like when you see multiple spinning centrifuges or what appear to be centrifuges, uh, your first thought is always going to be nuclear reactors. And the reason is, is because nuclear weapons and nuclear fuel, nuclear reactors, uh, are need a certain purity of uranium to function, to operate. Now, reactors need the purity levels to be like I don't know. Let's. I'm making these numbers up. They're like, they need to have a concentration that's like, I think it's like four percent uranium two thirty five, right? You get things that concentrated, and then you can put it in fuel rods and use it as a nuclear, you know, use it to create a fission reaction that can power uh, a nuclear power plant. But if you want a weapon, you need it to, you need the fission to happen real fast. And that means that you need it not to be at like 4% purity, but at like 1% purity, right? So the problem is, is that when I say purity, I mean there are atoms of uranium like 235 and like 238. So the difference is like a few protons. So in order to separate, to separate individual atoms based on the number of protons they have at scale, the only way to do it is to 
basically use a centrifuge. And you can not only use a centrifuge, you bind it with a gas called uranium hex and create uranium hexafluoride so that it's a little bit heavier molecule overall. And then you put it in a centrifuge and you spin it around and slowly, ever so slightly, the slightly three protons heavier molecules will start to fly to the outside. Just a little bit, right? Just a little bit, just a few percentage points. And then what you do is you siphon those off and you take the ever so slightly pure stuff on the inside that isn't caught by the centrifuge and you run it again and you siphon it off and you run it again. It takes months and months and months and months of running these centrifuges in order to purify uranium. And the danger, right, is that basically if you want to get if you want to get fuel for your nuclear power plant, you run it through a centrifuge. And if you want to get nuclear weapons grade uranium, you run it through a centrifuge more. So there's no way to know if a country is running a centrifuge. There's no way to know what they're going to do with that. There's not really any way to know unless you can inspect the facility how pure they're getting their uranium. So that's what you look at when you see a network of centrifuges like that. Your first thought is, of course, uranium purification. Uh, those are moving way too slow, though. Uh, okay, what's he talking about here? Triple support beam on internal chamber. Introduce 13 plus additional RF radio frequency cavities. Introduce blank into the blank. Replaced detectors 41 through 90. High precision beam now monitors for vibration exceeding 900. I, I don't know what any of this means. I'm too. I'm too uh, stupid. I have. I have a regular brain. Oh, 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 we got some brief flashes. You know when you insert one slide, I'm going to pause and break it down. Okay, so it's some sort of half screenshot of this. A muon filter. Oh, okay, muons are a type of subatomic particle. Uh, I think they only exist theoretically, but I'm not sure. There's a tracking chamber, trigger chambers, solenoid. <laughs> solenoid just sounds advanced. Solenoid, something magnet. All right, let's see. There was another slide before this. Oh, Interesting, Russian, Cyrillic. It says Cyrillic equals 8,000, 8, failure, failure, failure in reverse. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, resume. Hmm, this is... So supposedly in the comments have said that um, uh, October 17th, 1989 was actually a famous earthquake in Loma Linda, California. Okay, the animation of the door kind of melting away there is honestly pretty sick. Like, you can see it's just the regular threshold, and then it slowly starts to melt, and then becomes entirely surreal. I think that's so neat. That's such good editing. Oh, interesting. Appreciate the subtitles. Uh, that's a nice touch. Uh, you know, also worth pointing out that what's fascinating to me is that there's so much technology from the 1990s that is just, and, and this is true universally, right? So things that technology that gets proven like on the edge of what's possible then becomes commonplace. Good example is around this time in the early 90s, uh, for the first time, the, the human genome was sequenced. And it was actually pretty shocking because they thought that the human genome would change the face of medicine almost immediately. And because they believed that if you had one gene that one gene produced one protein. And once you knew every gene to every protein, you could just, it was an easy process to just reverse engineer, right, uh, the genetic instructions. If your body didn't, if you, you had a genetic disorder that didn't produce protein X, you could just figure out a way to 
change the genes to produce protein Y. And one gene, tweak it, flip a switch, you change the one protein expression. But when they did it, they found that they're actually the body did a bunch of things. There weren't enough genes for all the things that the body did. And they realized that a lot of the body's functions are the product of many gene sequences acting together. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, congenital blindness is sometimes the product of five or six or dozens of genes acting in concert. Uh, cancer risk is another great example. There's a few genetic, uh, there's like three or four genetic markers that we found have a huge impact on things like breast cancer or ovarian cancer, and those have been pretty big revelations, right? They in a subset of people that have these gene markers, uh, they effectively let them pr like pre-screen, prepare for cancer uh, because they're almost certain to get it or at a much greater likelihood. Um, but lots of other things, your family's risk of heart disease, uh, you know, colorblindness. Uh, well, colorblindness is very well understood, not a good example. Um, your you know family risk of i don't know myopia or weight gain those are the interplay of not just a whole bunch of genes right that they found but the whole bunch of everything else so the point is we finished the human genome project we realized the human body is way more complex than just dna instruction um but the human genome project took the government millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in the 90s now you can spit in a cup and mail it to a company who for 30 bucks will also run basic gene sequencing on you and tell you which part uh where your family is from which is preposterous preposterous that in three decades we've turned genetics uh from a like moon landing level discovery to spit in a cup and mail it off which makes the fact that the actual moon landing hasn't been replicated by any other country kind of bananas right the idea that you know in the 70s using rudimentary technology we were able to catapult three dudes to walk on the moon and we did it like six times right and then we stopped and not any other country in the past 70 years has even tried to do it again that's crazy to me Yeah, this is the other problem, man. Ethics, safety, in pursuit of profit, they get flexed all the time. And look in the real world, man. Look at those Amazon warehouse workers in the tornado that were ordered to stay in the warehouse. Dude, that was bananas. So if you think your your company won't put you in mortal danger, it will if they don't think you can sue them. And as I always tell people, you only have the rights you can defend in court. So if you can't afford a lawyer at all, good luck. Ooh, the dawn of the back rooms. Creepy. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for joining me. As always, let me know if you want more back rooms content. And of course, if you want to see some video breakdowns of combat vids that are too spicy for YouTube, check out the Patreon. I'll see you guys in the next one.